Okay, in this video I'll talk a bit about um, general factor models where we have higher order models um, and bifactor models. So a higher order model is a model in which we have latent variables at higher levels than we had before. So until now a CFA model has been a model where we have latent variables indicating uh, a set of uh, indicators and these were correlated with each other. Right? Now Instead of uh, doing that, what we're going to do is we're also going to explain the correlations at the latent level, again, with latent variables. So there are no correlations here between latent variables. And instead, we put a higher order latent variable on top of the lower order latent variables. So then we have a CFA model here, where the indicators are, again, latent variable models. And that's really the idea behind... Um, higher order latent variable models. So mathematically what it looks like is uh, actually very straightforward. We have sigma equals lambda psi lambda transpose plus theta before. And now we're simply going to take this psi and we're going to model that with a latent variable model as well. This is one way to do it. In SEM2 we'll see another way because we're going to make a bit more of a general framework where we don't need to uh, do this. We'll just have one more matrix here. But this is one way that you can think about it where we just have a latent variable model at the latent level as well. And we can keep do going on and on and on as well. This is just exactly the same as before. So we need to have the same rules for identification. Our latent model also needs to be identified. So that means that the higher order factor must also be scaled we need to put one factor loading or factor variance to one. And the number of variance and covariance in Psi, the latent, uh, the first latent variable variance coverage matrix, must be at least as much as the number of parameters used to model Psi, or like the degrees of freedom at the latent level must also be above zero, right? And the total degrees of freedom, so including everything, must also be above zero. That's really the main idea behind these uh, higher order level models, uh, higher order models. So what you then get is basically this idea that uh, we have a, a CFA model and we pack it out and what we get is another CFA model. And we could go on and on and on, right? So we can have like, uh, let's say, uh, indicators, and we have latents, and then we can make like higher order latents. And then what we can do is if we open up that latent variable model, we get like another latent variable model again, right? And et cetera, and et cetera, all the way down we go. Uh, and that's something that, that you can do. So what you're assuming then is that there is some higher order factor that is causing the co-variation between these two lower order factors. Now, um, people have been getting very creative with these kinds of models as well. And I think that's especially the case in um, in the world of intelligence research. So in intelligence research, you have seen a lot of different variations of these models. So the first one is the general factor model that has been designed for intelligence research. And then uh, we saw variations of that. So we saw like correlated multiple factors, like different uh, uh, subdomains. No, there is a G, it's like a latent variable here. Uh, no, no, there are again correlated uh, uh, latent variables, no, there's a G, but the G is like on top of these correlated latent variables and they're all nested in each other as well. And a hundred years long, there's been a debate also about which one of these is correct. Right? And this is still a simplification. You also see like this uh, fluid and crystallized intelligence and things like that. Uh, one thing I think it's important to know is that the moment you start doing this, you start adding things on the latent level and start uh, modeling that with more latent stuff. You're going to get in an area where things are getting more and more overlapping. So all these models are also very similar. Right? So for example, let's say this model here and this model here. These are extremely similar, right? So here we have four latents that are correlated, but here we have these correlations explained with a higher order model with three latents. It's not going to have that much difference in degrees of freedom if it has any at all. Um, but this has a very strong different cost interpretation as well. But it's going to be hard to really choose between any of these um, given your data alone. So at some point here you really have to start using theory 
and start relying on theory as well when you start to uh, say which one of these is the best. Now another um, model that we see quite often now is this bifactor model. They're also called hierarchical models, I believe, which is a bit of a tricky uh, uh, way of describing it uh, if you compare it to higher order models. The bifactor model is different. What we have here is we have a bifactor that's a general factor as well on all items. And then in each subdomain, we have specific items, uh, factors. And these are not correlated to each other. And that's a very important property of these bifactor models. Sometimes you see they are correlated to each other, but then the whole bifactor model idea sort of uh, starts to collapse. <coughs> so what this tells me is that we have three scales, one, two, three, four, four items in each. And there is a common variance between them. So everything is correlated with everything. But in each scales, items are more strongly correlated than they are between scales. Then uh, with this model, I can model that. So this is not a common variance. That's across all scales. But then I can say, well, okay, but in this scale here, uh, there is something else going on because they're very similar. So I'm going to model that with a unique factor. Now you have to realize that this is Machiavellianism after controlling for dark triad, right? So also in the G models, we have like uh, subdomain intelligence after controlling for intelligence. So it's more of a residual factor than actually the factor itself. So that makes the interpretation of these factor loadings pretty hard. But the uh, general factor, we can interpret as being like the general factor that uh, causes covariation across the scale. Now, here it gets already really tricky. We're going to talk a bit more about model equivalences and stuff in SEM2. <laughs> but we're going to get into a very tricky world where things are suddenly equivalent and not equivalent and nested in each other and not where you don't expect it. So uh, there's quite a lot of research that fits like a, a bifactor model, for example, and a higher order model and then compares them. Um, and then says, now it's a bifactor model. And these are very strong, different causal interpretations as well. Right? So this bifactor model assumes there's something here causing directly the items where the high order model assumes this is causing the items via the subdomains, right? So it's a very different model. But it actually turns out that these are equivalent in a way. It turns out that if you put equal, uh, not equality constraints, proportionality constraints on these uh, factor loadings here, you can perfectly reproduce this model on the left, which is uh, quite amazing. Because um, um, because it's a very different model, but it actually turns out that it's the same. But the G factor here is a very different interpretation, right? If we let go of these proportionality constraints, say says here, we get this general bifactor model, the one we would fit. Uh, so that means that uh, this model is nested in that, and because these are equal, this model is nested in the uh, hierarchical factor model which is crazy because they don't look at all alike, but that's true. And it turns out that this model is again equivalent to a model where we have a general factor, but it causes the items and also each uh, indicator directly with some, uh, some constraints on these effects. And that's actually a, a nice thing, I think, because that means that you can interpret the general factor of the bifactor model as a general factor, because it is equivalent to this one. And then the nice thing what you can do with this, you can see, okay, this is a general factor. And especially if I want to do like homogeneity test on the mean levels, for example, I can uh, uh, do that uh, directly here. And I can also do that with these factors. That's going to be harder in this case because you have that higher order model to deal with, right? So here we can say, okay, that's uh, what these means different, but uh, this means the same, for example. So that's one way in which you can use it. And the book describes a few more use of the bifactor model like that. So there's some very uh, complicated and uh, or weird equivalences and nesting relations between these models. And that also makes choosing between them quite hard, I think. So um, they have their uses. The general factor is nice. We want to model the general factor directly. Um, this higher order model is nice if I uh, want to really test this uh, particular hypothesis. 
But choosing between them is going to be a hard thing. So that's also uh, why I also argue a bit to be cost for that. So one example here would be the, the p-factor model, which you may have heard of, which is all about this. So they were comparing between, uh, like you yeah, have internalizing, externalizing, and thought disorder disorders. These are disorders. These are measured over different years. There's also a thing called methods factors that I'm not really using, um, describing, but basically this is like a common factor for like the same age range. And then they were comparing like a, um, let's see, a higher order, this is a bifactor model with correlations here, which is a bit weird, but okay. And a higher order model. Um, and they were comparing between them and then uh, I think this one is the one that fits best. Or maybe even this one. And that led to this whole argument that uh, there's now a P factor um, for general psychopathology, which we have to find the stuff in the brain, things like that. Uh, and the p-factor can be nice for summarizing the, the common variance, but I do think it's important to be cautious with um, how we choose this model, if it's really a bifactor or not. Maybe it doesn't even matter that much if it is or not. But the, the bifactor has a very different interpretation than the higher order model, so we want to be a bit careful about that. Uh, I also saw some other papers here that uh, you see a lot of these kind of bifactor models arising now. So this is a model for uh, neuroticism and uh, 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 so this is a p-factor model as well with the neuroticism added to it. And um, not just one, but two p's. Well, there's like multiple p-factors now. Uh, so we wrote a, uh, a, a commentary on this. Um, uh, Reed van Borg wrote this mainly. And it's a very nice paper, uh, I think where we um, explain some risks about this bifactor and higher order models and that they're very closely related. So you might get uh, in trouble if you really start comparing them and really choosing one over the other. Um, and there might also be some alternative explanations as well, like for example, a, a network model. But that's not really the part of this uh, course. Okay, that's it for this video on higher order and bifactor models.